Hello, my name is Jaru. Today I am talking about Deltarune. There will be major spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale, so please play them both before watching this. Today I've got a bit of an announcement. Due to all of the lore that got dumped on us during the Spamton sweepstakes, I've decided to put my Spamton analysis series on hold for a short time. I have a number of good reasons for this. Firstly, this new non-Spamton lore is really spicy, and I want to talk about it. Second, Spamton got a bunch of new lore himself, so I'm going to have to process all this new context before making further videos on him. And lastly, if I'm being honest, I feel a bit burnt out on Spamton after the sweepstakes, and I kinda need a break from him. I love the guy, but there is such a thing as consuming too much Spamton content, and I think I've reached my limit for the time being. I'll still be continuing the Spamton series and building towards the Spamton Mega Analysis video, but I'm going to take a short break to make some other videos first. That brings us to today's discussion, in which we will be analyzing the new lore regarding elemental pairs. This discussion will include an explanation of what elemental pairs are, my predictions as to what pairs the existing elements may have, as well as some predictions on what new elements are likely to be introduced in future chapters. But before we dive in, I'd just like to remind everyone that I do have a Patreon and a lot of builds to pay, so if you'd like to help fund the channel and make my life a little bit easier, I'd be most appreciative. With all that out of the way, let's discuss elemental pairs. So, for those who aren't aware, within Deltarune there is an element system. We've known about this system since Chapter 1, with characters like Suzy using rude elemental damage, but this system was greatly expanded on in Chapter 2, as all our recruits are given one or more elements in the recruit menu. Shortly after, some clever theorists like Halfbred Chaos noticed some curiosities in this system, with one of the most famous being that Spamton seemed to share an element with Task and Task Manager, to the point that these specific armor items items reduced the damage you take from all three of them. This raised some amusing questions about whether Spamton was a cat, but we had no clear answer for this strange connection until now. During the Spamton sweepstakes, there was a Spamton Q&A in which Spamton answered questions from the community, and the one of most importance for today's topic is this one here, in which someone asked Spamton about his strange connection to cats. He then reveals the existence of something known as Elemental Pairs, with his listed examples being Puppet slash Cat, Thunder slash Light, Dark slash Star, and Death slash Scythe. This explained a lot of peculiarities that many of us theorists had noticed. It of course explained the whole Spamted Cat connection, but it also explained one of the mysteries regarding the Sky Mantle. The Sky Mantle is an unused item that we first spot in Malleus's shop, and it's specifically described as granting resistance to electric and holy attacks. Now that we know about elemental pairs, we can confirm that electricity and holy are paired with one another, and it also shows that elements are sometimes referred to with different names. For example, in this item it refers to these elements as elect and holy, but that same pair is referred to as Thunder and Light by Spamton. This shows that electricity and thunder are equivalents, just as holy and light are equivalents. That may seem like a meaningless observation, but it's actually really important for Deltarune's lore, as you'll soon see. Now, there's a lot of fascinating things we can conclude using this new information, but the first thing I'd like to discuss is the exact nature of elemental pairs. It's worth noting that there is a difference between elemental pairs and a character simply having two elements. As we see in our recruit menu, some darkeners have multiple elements, but this is not the same as elemental pairs. Elemental pairs are two separate elements which are treated 
treated the exact same way by the rules of this world. So while cats and puppets have nothing to do with each other, they exist on the same elemental wavelength. And as a result, things that hurt one will also hurt the other, and things that resist one will also resist the other. By contrast, when a darkener is listed as having two elements, it has those elements because they reflect the darkener's nature. For example, Task Manager is a cat who loves order, and thus her two elements are cat and order. It's not that these elements are paired, rather they just happen to be housed within the same entity. To better demonstrate this property, let's create our own hypothetical darkener. Let's say there's a puppet of a skeleton, brought to life by the power of a dark fountain, thus creating a new darkener. Let's call him Bone Man. Bone Man is a skeleton, so one of his elements is death. But he's also a puppet, so his other element is puppet. These are his two elements, and as you can see, they reflect his character. However, death and puppet also have elemental pairs. Death is paired with scythe, and puppet is paired with cat. What this means is that if I fight Bone Man and I have armor that reduces the damage I take from scythes and cats, that will also reduce the damage I take from death and puppet. Make sense? Even though Bone Man only uses death and puppet elemental attacks, those elements are paired with something that I am resistant to, and thus I am resistant to Bone Man's attacks as well. Notably, Bone Man is not a cat, nor does he use a scythe. As a result, we can deduce that while your elements reflect your character, your elemental pairs do not, and thus your elemental pairs are only important in a combat situation. So, while his elements may be paired with Scythe and Cat, those elements don't reflect who he is, unlike Death and Puppet, which do reflect who he is. With the basic mechanics of elemental pairs now fully understood, we can get to the fun stuff. There's one main goal I'd like to accomplish in this video. I'd like to make my predictions on what I think each element's pair might be. This will include pairing existing elements with each other, but it will also include me predicting future elements that I think will be introduced. Now, I don't intend to predict every possible element that Toby Fox might throw our way, as that would be practically impossible. I only intend to predict elements that I think are likely to be introduced as pairs for our existing elements. With all that explained, let's dive in. The elements that we know of are as follows. Jewel, Heart, Order, Rabbit, Dust, Fight, Mouse, Puzzle, Blade, Ice, Electric, Virus, Cat, Color, Rude, Chaos, Holy, Dark, Star, Death, Scythe, and Puppet. Each of these elements presumably has a pair, and eight of them have already been confirmed. Electric is paired with Holy, Cat is paired with Puppet, Dark is paired with Star, and Death is paired with Scythe. All of these were confirmed by Spamton during the Spamton Q&A, although we already knew Holy and Electric were paired thanks to the Sky Mantle, and we suspected there was some link between Spamton and Cats. However, that is the end of our confirmed elemental pairs, which still leaves us with 14 elements lacking partners. Thankfully, one of these pairs can be pretty easily predicted just using what we know, namely the pairing of Chaos with Rude. There's a lot of reasons to believe these are paired, and it mostly revolves around the connections between Susie, the primary Rude elemental character, and Jevil the primary Chaos Elemental character. The connections between them are as follows. Jevil's weapon can only be used by Susie. She has remarks regarding her comfort with Jevil's armor item. She quotes Jevil outright when equipping Devil's Knife. She and Jevil both regard themselves as Shark. And most importantly of all, the TP cost on Susie's Rude Buster, which deals rude elemental damage, is reduced when using Devil's Knife. 
The fact that a chaos elemental weapon reduces the TP cost of a rude elemental spell is more than enough to confirm for me that these two elements are paired. With that out of the way, we've only got 12 more elements to go. However, this is where things get a lot trickier. Jevil and Susie's connections made pairing Chaos and Rude fairly reasonable, but that's where our hard evidence runs out. In order to proceed with this analysis, we have to come up with some new strategies for analyzing the elements. The most logical first step is to see if we can find any rhyme or reason to the existing elemental pairs. If we understand the logic behind why these elements are paired together, then we may be able to use that to make deductions about the other elements. When looking at these existing pairs, I can see two possible explanations for why they're paired the way they are. The first possibility is that it's random. Cat and Puppet are so different that it's rather tempting to think these pairings were just plucked out of thin air. However, while it's possible that it's random, I find it unlikely that Toby Fox would squander such a fantastic opportunity to use the element system to further the themes of his story. The second possibility, and the possibility that I'm inclined to believe, is what I've dubbed Sphere of Influence Theory, or SOI Theory for short. This theory holds that each element is not just the one concept that it says it is. Rather, I think each element includes a broad range of other concepts that are adjacent to that element. For example, Holy. This element is referred to as light by Spamton, even though the concepts of holy and light are fundamentally different. They are related, but they're not the same. I think Toby Fox is using this slightly different terminology to subtly hint at the fact that each element encompasses a broad range of adjacent concepts. So while the element is called holy, that concept is strongly associated with light, and so an enemy who wields a light-based power like, say, Rules Card may have the holy element purely because he wields power over light. To put this into terms you may be more familiar with, in Avatar The Last Airbender, there are characters called Waterbenders, who have the power to control the element of water. However, even though they are technically just Waterbenders, they are also able to control a number of things that are adjacent to water. This includes ice, mist, blood, and even plants. Even though all of these are technically different things, they all fall under the umbrella of waterbending. I think Deltarune's elements are similar in that even though an element is described with one word, it actually encompasses a variety of similar things, which is why a person with the mouse element can be anything from a mouse-like jigsaw piece to a literal computer mouse. These are fundamentally different things, but they are both included within the sphere of influence of the mouse element. To be clear, I'm not saying that Avatar The Last Airbender and Deltarune use the same element system. They don't. I'm just using Avatar as a way to help you understand my theory regarding Deltarune. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but what does that have to do with elemental pairs? Well, when you look at these existing pairs, you start to notice a pattern. Each element is often found in the company of its partner. Star and darkness seem like opposites, but whenever you want to look at stars, you have to look at the night sky, which is mostly darkness. They are elemental pairs because they are found together. Death and Scythe are often found together, just as rudeness and chaos are often found together. That said, when looking at Holy and Electric, and especially when looking at Cat and Puppet, it can get a little harder to tell how these elements are supposedly found together. This is where SOI theory becomes so important. On their own, the concepts of Cat and Puppet are a pretty odd pair. You do not typically find puppets where you find cats. However, if you instead assume that puppet is not just referring to puppets, but instead to all concepts adjacent to puppets, suddenly it starts to make sense. 
Just as water bending includes things like ice, blood, and plants, the puppet element includes things like marionettes, sock puppets, and most importantly, toys. You won't find many puppets hanging around cats, but you will almost certainly find a variety of cat toys. This is where cat and puppet intersect. This SOI interpretation is further supported by the Spamton sweepstakes. Spamton gave out a variety of bizarre prizes during this event, but I think part of the purpose behind some of these prizes was to hint that Spamton's puppet element encompasses a variety of things other than just puppets. There's this pair of Spamton socks, which includes a description that specifically mentions using said socks as sock puppets. This is quite different from how Spamton describes himself, as he describes himself as being controlled by strings, which makes him less like a sock puppet and more like a marionette. Although, given how Spamton looks like Billy the Puppet in his normal form, you could argue that Spamton Neo is a marionette, while regular Spamton is more akin to a ventriloquist doll. Regardless, the most important hint provided by the Spamton sweepstakes is none other than the Spamton Worm, a Spamton-themed worm toy that seems pretty random, but when taken in the context of elemental pairs, it suddenly makes perfect sense. A popular variety of cat toys are long, worm-shaped tubes that wiggle around. Look familiar? For those who are struggling with this concept, try imagining a Venn diagram. The cat element includes a variety of things that are related to cats, such as cat people and balls of string, while the puppet element includes a variety of things that are related to puppets, which includes ventriloquist dolls, marionettes, sock puppets, and toys. And the section where these two spheres overlap is where we find toys for cats, such as the Spamton Worm. The Spamton Worm is the missing link as it hints at the real reason that these two elements are paired together. The place where you see these elements side by side in the real world is when a cat is playing with its toys. A much simpler example of this is holy and electric. The holy element presumably includes things related to holiness, such as light, healing, and angels, while electric has things like robots, computers, and electronic lights. Where these two are found together is in the sky. The sky is strongly associated with heaven, but it's also associated with lightning. Heck, lightning itself is both a form of electricity and it's often associated with divine punishment. If a god is going to smite you, they're probably going to use a lightning bolt. As such, that is where holy and electric overlap. So, that is the logic that I think Toby Fox is using to decide elemental pairs. I'm not going to pretend that this SOI interpretation is a perfect solution, because it's not. It's undeniable that the logic connecting cats and puppets is a lot more tenuous than the logic connecting something like death and scythe. However, this SOI style of approach is the best explanation I can think of. As such, this gives us our first method for deducing pairs. If two elements often appear together, then that increases the chance that they are elemental pairs in Deltarune. However, that's not the only strategy I've employed for solving this mystery. You see, the SOI approach works fine, but it's approaching this topic from a real-world perspective. Another perspective, which is arguably even more important, is that of Undertale and Lightners. What do I mean by this? Well, let's look back at Spamton. One of the things that first clued us in that he was connected to cats was the fact that Spamton shares a lot of dialogue and attributes with cats from the Light World and from Undertale. Spamton is a sketchy salesman who has a shop in the dump, just like Caddy. He also dabbles with dark forces for his own benefit, just like the other Caddy. The only lightener to use the term Big Shot is Dad Cat, and most notably of all, Spamton has this line about hell and vacation days. Sound familiar? 
This is a direct callback to a line that Burger Pants, a cat, has in the genocide route of Undertale. This means that not only will Toby Fox hint at elemental pairs using dialogue and attributes, but he'll also do so in the form of callbacks to characters and dialogue from Undertale. To put it simply, some elements will be paired together because they're often connected in real life, like death and scythe, while others will be paired together because they're often connected in Toby Fox's world. So, with that in mind, I scoured both games to find hints as to the elemental pairs, and after many hours of searching, I've arrived at my conclusions. I now have predictions for each and every elemental pair for the elements we've encountered thus far. We'll start with the predictions that I have the most confidence in, and then we'll work our way towards the predictions that are a little more dubious. First on our list is the dust element, which is exclusively held by Rabbik. Now, if we just used the SOI approach, then it would be nearly impossible to solve dust, as dust appears almost everywhere. Thankfully, the second approach was far more fruitful, as dust has far greater meaning in Undertale than it does in real life, as monsters rather famously turn into dust when they die. However, the death element has already been paired with Scythe, so while it would have made a lot of sense to pair dust with death, we can't. So what's the next best option? Well, my answer to that question is this. I think the dust element in Deltarune is paired with an element we've yet to see, which I am dubbing the undead element. There are two major reasons for me to think that there is going to be an undead element. First is the RPG factor. It is extremely common in almost all RPGs to have enemies that are undead, such as zombies and ghouls, and thus it's also rather common for them to have some sort of element associated with them. Sometimes this element is simply darkness or poison, as seen in Final Fantasy, but sometimes they get their own unique element, like the ghost type in Pokemon. Undertale and Deltarune love to reference classic RPG tropes, so it makes a lot of sense for Toby Fox to introduce undead enemies in later chapters of Deltarune. I personally suspect the graveyard will receive a dark fountain at some point, and if so, then that means we may end up encountering the remains of lightners that have been reanimated as darkners. Such creatures would naturally deserve the classification of undead. However, the second and much more important reason I think undead will be an element is because the idea of a person dying and then being brought back as some sort of new, unholy creature is a rather prominent concept in Undertale. Flowey, the Amalgamates, and even Kara are all examples of this. And the reason I think dust is paired with undead is because of the way monster dust can be used to create such creatures. Dust in Undertale carries the essence of monsters, and thus, if you find a way to animate something that has a monster's essence, as is what happened with Flowey, then you can bring them back in a new, unnatural form. Dust may usually symbolize death, but in many prominent cases it symbolizes unnatural reincarnation. Now, keep in mind, while I'm dubbing this element the undead element, I am still using it in the SOI sense, which means that any concept adjacent to undead would also be qualified for this element. Some examples of Lightners and Undertale characters that I think would warrant this classification includes Flowey, Amalgamates, Kara, Ghosts, and Skeletons. All of these creatures would be associated with necromancy in a more typical RPG, so I think it makes a lot of sense for them to get their own unique element. Also, while I'm dubbing it the undead element, it could just as easily be called the ghost element, or the necro element, or something similar. 
I am actually extremely confident in this prediction, as it just makes too much sense given Toby Fox's history of resurrecting his characters as nightmares. Next up is the heart element, which is held by Hathi and Head Hathi. Using the SOI approach, there are a lot fewer things adjacent to hearts than there are to dust. If you're discussing hearts in the metaphorical sense, then it's adjacent to emotions and relationships. And if you're using it in the literal sense, then it's adjacent to organs, blood, bones, and other biological material. When looked at from a Toby Fox perspective, hearts play a pretty prominent role in his games, as they are the symbol for souls. This makes them adjacent to a variety of major Undertale and Deltarune concepts, such as determination, fate, power, reality, and the conflict between humanity and monsters. So, what element do I think heart is paired with? Well, while there are a lot of options, I settled on another brand new element which I am dubbing the love element. Love makes a lot of sense in a real world context as hearts are often used as the symbol for love. But more important is the Toby Fox perspective, as love is an extremely important concept within the worlds of his games. Love symbolizes the two paths one can take in Undertale, with the pacifist route symbolizing regular love, while the genocide route symbolizes LV, or level of violence. This dichotomy between love and love is perfect for the elemental pairs, and it is even reflected in the characters of Hathi and Head Hathi. Hathi is a perfect stand-in for the pacifist version of Frisk, as they don't really talk, but are filled with care and a desire to support the ones around them. They are loving, empathetic, and the least violent members of the king's army. By contrast, Head Hathi is far more aggressive and emotionally distant. She has fewer friends and is much more proficient at combat. In fact, Head Hathi differs from regular Hathi in that she gains the ice element, which not only emphasizes her icy demeanor, but also further plays into the idea of her being a soft representation of LV, as ice is the element most strongly associated with the weird route, which is by far the most violent and horrific route Deltarune currently has. Once again, I am quite confident in this prediction, as it plays very nicely into the core themes of Toby Fox's world. Although I will admit that love may be a bit too similar to heart to deserve its own element slot. I could be wrong, but I still think I'm on the right track here. Next up is the Order element, which is held by Pawn Man, Ambulance, and Task Manager. Unfortunately, Order is another one of those concepts that is so broad that it could be considered adjacent to almost any other concept, so the SOI approach doesn't do us much good here. That leaves the Toby Fox approach, and in this regard, I focus most of my analysis on Pawn Man, as they are the only example of a pure, order elemental being that we've encountered. Ambulance and Task Manager are more focused on the electric and cat sides of their personalities, respectively. So I think Pawn Man is a better representation of the element overall. As such, after thoroughly analyzing every tiny detail surrounding the Pawn Man and scouring Undertale's code for any hints, I've arrived at a fairly confident conclusion. I think the Order element is paired with yet another brand new element, which I am dubbing the Moon element. This is once again partially due to RPG logic and partially due to Undertale callbacks. In many RPGs, and in fantasy settings in general, the Sun and Moon are often differentiated as being different sources of power, and since we've already gotten a star element, it makes a lot of sense for there to be a counterpart to that in the form of the Moon. However, the reason that I believe it's paired with the Order element is entirely due to the Undertale character that I think Pawn Man most prominently connects with. I am referring to Night Knight. 
Night Knight is a very minor enemy that you fight in the core, and due to the core's branching paths, many players forget about her entirely, but she's actually the only character in Undertale to prominently feature the moon as a part of her motif. The symbol on her head is a moon, her name is a reference to wishing someone a good night, and she even summons the moon itself to attack you during battle. Now, technically, she also has references to the sun, as her weapon is called the Good Morning Star, and she summons the sun to attack you as well. But I would argue that these are exceptions that prove her moon connection rather than contradict it. Her main focus is on nighttime, hence her name, and when you dig a little deeper, you realize that even her sun-based attacks are actually moon references. In the code of Undertale, her moon attack is labeled Sky Moon. Her meteor attack is labeled Moon Meteor, and her sun attack is labeled Sun Moon. Even her non-moon attacks are still considered moon-related by Toby Fox, which I think shows where her preferred element lies. As for why I think the moon element is tied to the order element, that is because of the prominent similarities in character between Night Knight and Pond Man. Both are extremely simple creatures who don't talk or barely talk at all. Both are very neutral towards the protagonist and are only fighting them because they've been ordered to. They are the only enemies in their respective games that can be pacified by putting them to sleep with a lullaby, and their greatest desire is to sleep, as Night Knight's happy ending is about her taking a well-deserved nap, while Pawn Man's only listed like in the recruit menu is sleeping. To put it simply, there is no other character that has more similarities to Pond Man than Night Knight. When looking at them in a Venn diagram, I'd say the place where moon and order overlap is in the lunar phases. The moon always goes through the same pattern month after month, which is very orderly, and the moon also causes the tides at the same times and places as well. In fact, to further tie Night Knight to the moon element, there's the rather interesting detail of her being easier to put to sleep if you know Shiren's song and sing that to her instead. Why would Night Knight be more vulnerable to Shiren's song than to a normal lullaby? Well, if you're a longtime viewer of my channel, you'll know I think Shiren's song is the famous song from the sea that we keep hearing about. The sea is intimately tied to the moon, which is why I think Shiren's song has such a profound effect on Night Knight. Furthermore, Night Knight's chest is referred to as a dragon mouth in the code, and dragons are strongly associated with the ocean in Japanese culture. This is relevant because Toby Fox is a big fan of Japanese culture and loves to reference it in his games. That's part of why Japanese is the only other language besides English that Deltarune has an official translation for. Admittedly, I'm not as confident in this moon order prediction as I was with the previous two predictions, but I do think this option makes the most sense given what we know right now. Next up is the mouse element, which is held by Jigsari, Mouse, and Mouse Wheel. Mouse is a strangely specific element, but that does mean the options for what it could be paired with are also rather limited. Mice are associated with cheese, vermin, disease, and labyrinths, but thanks to the various prominent mice in fiction, such as Mickey Mouse, Chuck E. Cheese, and Pikachu, you can also associate mice with things like cartoons, mascots, and video games. From the Toby Fox perspective, there have always been mice in his games, although they've never held a prominent position in the story. There was the running gag of the mice seeking cheese in Undertale, as well as this scarfed mouse in Snowden who is really bad at telling jokes, but aside from that, there really isn't much in the way of mice. So with that limited pool of options and no major characters to pull from, what elemental pair did I settle on for mouse? Well, after much deliberation, I decided that Mouse would be the first element that is paired with an existing element in Deltarune. Namely, I think Mouse is paired with 
puzzle. At first, I was hesitant to go this route, as Jigsari already has both the mouse and puzzle elements. Wouldn't it be strange for a character to have both halves of an elemental pair? But after thinking about it more, I actually think this is totally fine. For one, there are darkeners who have multiple copies of the same element, such as Mouse Wheel, which has three mouse elements. If it's okay for a character to have multiples of just one element, then Jake Sari having both halves of an elemental pair seems no more strange. On top of that, when you look at the existing pairs, there are plenty of characters who would definitely end up with both sides of a pair if they were in this game. Take the Death and Scythe pair, for example. If Toby Fox introduced a Grim Reaper style of character, then it would only be reasonable for them to have both Death and Scythe. As such, I think it's definitely feasible for a Darkner like Jigsari to have both Mouse and Puzzle. But that's just my justification for Jigsari. Why exactly do I think Toby Fox would pair Mouse with Puzzle? Well, the first and most important reason stems from me using the SOI theory. You see, I don't think the puzzle element exclusively includes puzzles in its sphere of influence. In fact, I think puzzle extends to include a variety of games as well. Namely, I think many types of board games and video games would qualify for this element. And with this expanded definition of the puzzle element, the mouse element being paired with it starts to make more sense. Mice typically run around in mazes, which is a classic form of puzzle. In addition, the running gag of the mice in Undertale trying to reach the cheese could be seen as them trying to solve a puzzle, and the mice in Deltarune are major participants in the puzzles of Chapter 2. But, above all else, the detail that really spurned me to embrace the mouse-puzzle connection was this. The Mouse Token is an unused armor item found in the game's code, which reduces the damage you take from the mouse element. The description for this item is this, a golden coin with a once powerful mouse wizard engraved. When equipping it to Noelle, she says, from the Family Entertainment Center? These two sentences pretty much confirm that this is a reference to Chuck E. Cheese, as not only are Chuck E. Cheese locations referred to as family entertainment centers, not only do such places employ golden tokens with a mouse on them, but Chuck E. Cheese as a brand has long since tumbled from its peak, meaning it used to be a powerful popular brand, but it is now greatly reduced, just like the mouse wizard on the mouse token. Now, why does this Chuck E. Cheese reference suggest a connection to the puzzle element? Well, for those who aren't aware, the main appeal of going to a Chuck E. Cheese was the extensive arcade. Countless games could be played here, and since I consider games to fall within the sphere of the puzzle element, I consider this entire Chuck E. Cheese reference to be a strong suggestion that mouse and puzzle are paired. As you can tell by the sheer quantity of mental gymnastics I had to go through to justify this pair, there's definitely a lot more speculation at play here than any of the other pairs I've predicted thus far. I am fairly confident in this one, but I am aware that the evidence is admittedly much more scattered and questionable. With that said, this mouse puzzle prediction is the last of my predictions that I feel confident in. The rest of these predictions, while definitely the best answers I could come up with, are much more open to criticism. Next is the fight element, which is held by Bloxer and Werewerewire. Fighting is a pretty broad concept, and depending on whether you're discussing street fights, boxing, or flat-out war, you can attach a variety of concepts to fighting, which makes the SOI approach less than helpful. That leaves the Toby Fox approach, and it's here that I think the best option presents itself. Bloxer and Werewerewire only care about two things, training and fighting. There is also a major link between these characters and classic shonen anime tropes, with both of them referencing Dragon Ball pretty heavily. 
Wereware wire smells like a lightning strike, and the air around them crackles with fighting spirit, reminiscent of Dragon Ball characters being surrounded by electrical sparks as their power level rises. Wereware wire also heavily employs laser beams and energy ball attacks, which are common techniques in Dragon Ball. Even its description is pretty much an anime reference, as the idea of a powerful, cool-headed figure suddenly becoming flustered when around a girl or an admirer is extremely common in shonen. Just to really send this anime message home, when you return to the dojo at the end of chapter 2, this Bloxer comments on how his power level is falling behind the others, and now all he can do is stand on the sidelines and gasp. This is extremely common in Dragon Ball, as older characters like Krillin get outclassed by newer, more powerful characters, and can only watch the battle from the sidelines. So, when you think of anime, a love of fighting, and Undertale, what character comes to mind? There's really only one option. I am of course referring to Undyne. Undyne is all about training to get stronger, loves anime and combat, and she even gets her own anime power-up final battle to save the world in the genocide route. If any character embodies the fight element, it's her. However, this raises a new sort of dilemma. You see, unlike Night Knight, who only really had one or two attributes that we could really focus on, Undyne is a main character in Undertale, and is thus very well fleshed out. She's a complex, three-dimensional character with many different facets to her, and any of them could be the elemental pair we're looking for. That said, some of them are certainly more likely than others, so let's list out some of Undyne's most prominent traits and see if we can't figure anything out. Aside from loving anime and fighting, Undyne is a fish, she enjoys cooking, she plays the piano, she's a hero, head of the royal guard, chief of police, and she's gay. Hilariously, all of these options have a semi-decent chance of being an element. If mouse and cat could be an element, then so could fish. If the act of fighting can be an element, so can cooking. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of musical element, there being a hero element isn't totally far-fetched, and while I highly doubt there will be a gay element, Toby Fox has certainly done stranger things. You could even make an argument that fight should be paired with order, since Undyne is the leader of the Royal Guard and the police in these games, showing she's always an enforcer of law and order. However, I think there are flaws in just about all of these options. Unlike something like Mouse and Puzzle, the connections between fish and fighting are almost non-existent. If Undyne herself wasn't the embodiment of fighting, then we'd probably never think to combine the two. Cooking, similarly, has very little connection to fighting outside of the fact that some people who fight also cook, which is a pretty weak connection. Music and fighting makes a little more sense, since there is such a thing as using music on the battlefield, and most fight scenes in movies and TV shows are accompanied by music. That said, music accompanies all sorts of things aside from fighting, so that connection is far from unique. While heroism and fighting typically go hand in hand, it almost feels a little counterintuitive to the spirit of Toby Fox to pair them together, as the main way you act as a hero in his games is by avoiding fighting at all costs. It's actually considered foolish and outright villainous to fight in most contexts. And while there's certainly an argument that Undyne embodies order, I honestly think that's not really what's at the core of her character. She's more akin to an anime protagonist, in that she'll abide by the law and enforce it because it's generally a force for good, but she'll happily break the law if she thinks it interferes with her moral code. Plus, Jevil, an embodiment of chaos, loves to fight, and I don't think he'd be super keen on fighting if it was tied to order. Lastly, I mostly threw in the gay element as a meme, but even if it were a thing, I think we'd probably have seen some evidence of that by now, if you know what I mean. Out of all of these, the music option is probably the strongest, but that's not saying much. So, 
What do I think is the answer? Using Undyne, what element do I think is paired with fighting? Well, honestly, I don't think it's any of these. I think the answer is a little more esoteric. My best guess for what element is paired with fighting is a brand new element which I am dubbing the sports element. Now, that might seem like it came out of left field, and to an extent, it did. But I want you to try to get into the head of Toby Fox. You've finished Undertale, and you're on to making Deltarune. You've got this brand new element system that you want to implement, but you want it to call back to characters and concepts in Undertale. And one of your elements is the sports element, which you want to pair with fighting. And the most prominent lover of fighting in Undertale is Undyne. However, her character really didn't have much to do with sports in Undertale. In fact, sports didn't really come up very much at all in that game. What do you, as Toby Fox, do in this situation? Well, if I was Toby Fox, I would slowly release additional stories featuring Undyne that tie her to sports, and thus retroactively make the sports and fighting connection more based in the lore of my characters and world. So. Did Toby Fox do that? Did he release additional stories featuring Undyne prominently playing sports? Yes. Yes, he did. In the Alarm Clock app, which is a cancelled app that Toby Fox made and then uploaded to the internet, there are a number of stories about what the Undertale monsters got up to after the true pacifist ending. You click on a character, and you get a story about them from their perspective. And what is Undyne's story about? It's about her playing hockey with the other characters. She's very into this experience, and after a while, she decides to make the game a little more fair by having all the other players on one team and her alone on her own team. And she does extremely well, despite those odds. Even though we've never really seen this side of her, Undyne is exceptional at sports, as her fighting spirit and love of competition spur her on. But this is not the only instance of Undyne playing sports. In Deltarune, after the events of Chapter 1, you can talk to Monster Kid about a time they were playing handball with some friends. The ball rolled over to Susie, who kicked the ball into Undyne's police car. And what did Undyne do? She got out, cracked her knuckles, and proceeded to whoop them all at handball. Undyne has now been depicted enthusiastically and competently playing two separate sports. In terms of confirmed instances of characters playing sports, Undyne might have more examples than anyone else. This is on top of the fact that sports seem to play a much larger role in Deltarune than they ever did in Undertale. From the Clover fight, to the Monster Kid story, to the Baseball Moon, and the general baseball obsession of the Queen. And that's not even to mention Jockington, a brand new character who seems to be the very embodiment of sports. In fact, in the Spamton sweepstakes, on Noelle's blog, she interacted with someone heavily implied to be Jockington, and that person's username is literally just sports. This inclusion of further sports references on Noelle's blog, which is a place Toby Fox has hidden a ton of deep lore, further grows my suspicion that sports is in fact a new element we will encounter, and I think it's paired together with fighting. Even just from an SOI perspective, fighting and sports have plenty of overlap. Many of the attributes you need to be a good fighter, such as being fit, competitive, and skilled, also apply to being good at sports. Heck, some sports are literally based around combat, like boxing. In fact, the dojo, where all the fight elemental characters hang out, has a boxing ring in the center. So, in summary. 
I think sports is an element that exists due to the increased references and emphasis on sports in Deltarune and due to the sudden addition of sports-related stories for the most blatantly fight elemental character from Undertale. The overlap between these concepts is solid, and there's plenty of opportunities to have darkeners themed around various sports equipment. Am I supremely confident in this prediction? Maybe not, but it is the best option I can think of. Next up is the Blade element, which is held exclusively by the Rudin Ranger. As a concept, blades don't come up super often, so the SOI approach is decent for this. You're either using a blade as a weapon, or you're using it as a tool. But it's when you dive into the Toby Fox perspective that things get really elaborate. For one, blades are commonly associated with humans, as we see Frisk, Kara, Chris, and this flashback human all wielding them. However, that's not to say monsters don't use blades. Plenty of monsters use swords and knives, and if you expand the blade element to include any bladed weapon, then that encompasses things like axes and halberds. Unfortunately, this broadness of the blade concept makes it hard to narrow down its pair, even when using Undertale as a reference. The Rudin Ranger doesn't provide us much insight either. It's a fairly standard enemy without much obvious hints as to what blade might be paired with. It likes Power Rangers, apparently, but Power Rangers have been associated with all sorts of things, so that doesn't really help us. In Deltarune specifically, blades have additional significance in that blades are what are used to create dark fountains, as even Noelle's pin is referred to as a blade by Queen. However, both darkness and holy, the two elements one would most prominently associate with dark fountains, have already been used up. So, where does that leave us? What element could I possibly predict to have a pairing with Blade? Well, after a lot of contemplation, I've come to a tentative conclusion. I think Blade is paired with another brand new element, which I am dubbing the Shield Element. Now, I know what you're thinking. The Shield Element? Really? That's so basic, it hurts. But hold on, hear me out. I think there are some pieces of evidence to suggest this may be the case. For starters, one of the first new mechanics introduced in Deltarune was the defend mechanic, symbolized by a shield. And when you look at the other actions on the menu, you start to realize that most of these images either have an element already or are likely to receive an element in the future. The attack button has a sword, which is reflected in the blade element, while the magic button has a fireball, which is likely going to be reflected in a fire element which is inevitably going to be introduced. As such, if blade and fire are going to be represented in this menu, why not have the defend shield be represented as well? Furthermore, there's also the special property of Chris's sword. You see, something many people aren't aware of is that when Chris uses the defend button, they don't just pull out a random shield. Their sword actually transforms into a shield. Think about that. Chris's blade and Chris's shield are two sides of the same coin, so wouldn't it make sense for the blade element to also be paired with a shield? And lastly, there's also the SOI angle to think about. Swords and shields often appear together, and more importantly, when you realize blade likely symbolizes all manner of weaponry, then it only makes sense for the shield element to symbolize all manner of defensive tools like armor. And if you really want to delve a little too deep into my own personal theories, it would make a lot of sense for Chris, who symbolizes the blade element, to be opposed by Oberon Smog, an entity who symbolizes the shield element on account of him being a turtle. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this blade shield prediction is super well grounded, because it's not. But I think it has just enough groundwork to be feasible. 
Next up is the rabbit element, which is exclusively held by Rabbik. Now, I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. There's very little I could think of to pair rabbit with. The Snowden rabbits exist, so you might think to pair rabbit with ice, but wouldn't it make more sense to use a reindeer element instead, considering Noel exists? Or maybe I should have paired rabbit with the moon element, since rabbits and the moon are connected in Japanese folklore. In fact, the rabbit in the moon is said to create confectionery treats in Japanese myth, just like how the Snowden shopkeeper sold cinnamon bunnies. Additionally, you could argue that this rabbit operating an inn where people go to sleep could further tie rabbits to nighttime and thus to the moon. However, there's no other moon connections for the rabbits in Toby Fox's world, Night Night has no rabbit-like qualities despite being connected to the moon, and rabbit just really doesn't pair with the moon as well as Order did. That leaves us with... What? Rabbits are so strangely specific, yet so vague, that it's hard to figure out what they could possibly be connected to in Toby Fox's mind. And that brings us to Rabbik. You see, there's a reason I didn't discuss Rabbik very much during the dust segment of this video, and that's because their character is far more focused on their rabbit half than it is on their dust half. Their attacks are all rabbit based, for example. So using Rabbik's dialogue as a basis, what element do I think is most likely to be paired with rabbit? Well, to put it simply, I think Rabbit is paired with another new element, which I am dubbing the Frog Element. And I am concluding that for one simple reason. The only character Rabbit has any meaningful connections with is Froggit, as Rabbit has two lines referencing them. First, there's this line, in which Rabbit says, Rabbits are the new frogs, which is already tying the two species together. But if that wasn't proof enough, there's also this line in which Chris notes that they smell like dusty mustard. Why is that significant? It's because Froggit is noted as smelling like mustard seed in Undertale. The only Lightner and the only Undertale character that Rabbik is associated with is Froggit. And while it only has two lines connecting them, those lines are very hard evidence. And since Froggit has no notable attributes beyond being a frog, it just stands to reason that the Rabbit element should be paired with the Frog element. Is this the strongest prediction I've made? Not even close. Outside of Toby Fox explicitly comparing them, there's zero reason for me to compare frogs with rabbits. I guess they both hop around, but that's literally the only thing they have in common. And yet, <laughs> I still feel vaguely decent about this prediction purely because it seems like Toby Fox himself is pushing it. I cannot claim to be so confident about the rest of these predictions. Next up is the ice element, which is only associated with Head Hathy and Noel. You'd think such a prominent element as ice would be a lot easier to find an element for, but no, it's not. Ice, as a concept, is so broad that the SOI approach doesn't give me any clear hints. And even using the Toby Fox perspective doesn't help because there's an entire town based around snow, and a lot of the characters in that town have ties to the cold. Now, that's not to say there's no options, there most certainly are, but rather, there's so little hard evidence for any of them that it gets hard to narrow it down to just one concept. Through Noelle's attributes alone, ice could be paired with reindeer, violence, sleeping, Christmas, love, angels, death, and more. Noel is just too complex of a character to tell which part of her personality could be hinting at Ice's elemental pair. 
and Head Hathi isn't much better, as aside from being a little more lonely and a little more violent, there really isn't much to go off of, and she's honestly got more to do with her heart element than with her ice element. As such, what do we do? What element seems most likely to be paired with ice, given what we know? Well, after thinking it through, I spotted a connection that I think has some decent grounding in Deltarune's story, and I don't even have to invent a new element for it. I think the ice element is paired with the virus element. Why do I think this? Well, starting with the SOI approach, the cold is very commonly accompanied by illness, as you can only spend a short time in the cold before becoming sick. I definitely think the virus element encompasses all manner of illnesses, and not just viruses, so I think the overlap with ice is definitely there. But then there's the Toby Fox perspective, and it's here that we look back to Noel. Or, to be more precise, we look back to Noelle and Rudy. Noelle's relationship with her dad is easily the most important relationship she has, and even though they're such different people, they get along very well. And if Rudy were to die in a future chapter, that would make this relationship even more integral to Noelle's character. As such, to not beat around the bush, I think this could be hinting to the fact that Noelle embodies the ice element, while Rudy, at this point in the story, embodies the virus element. This adds up really well thematically, as they are both being tormented by their respective elements. Rudy is obviously being tortured by his illness, as it keeps him from his family, but Noelle is very much tortured by ice as well. She's not tortured by literal ice, but by two forms of metaphorical ice. The first is her fear. Noelle is scared of everything, and will freeze up when faced with danger. And the second metaphorical ice comes in the form of her mother. Noelle's mother is constantly described as an icy person who is generally unpleasant to be around, to the point that Noelle would rather stay at a friend's house than bother her mother while she's at work. As such, seeing as how Noelle's metaphorical ice manifested as her core element in the Dark World, it seems highly likely that Rudy's illness would manifest as a virus element further supporting the idea that ice and virus are related. It's a stretch, but it's a vaguely compelling stretch, which is better than any other interpretation I can think of. Next is the jewel element, which is held by Rudin and the Rudin Ranger. I'm gonna be honest, this one was hard. There's so many different things you could associate with jewels, especially since they are associated with wealth, which in turn connects this element with a huge swath of concepts. And in the world of Toby Fox, jewels are pretty rare. There's these diamond people who exist, but they have no notable attributes. They're just normal people. And outside of the Rudins themselves, jewels are not brought up almost at all in Deltarune or or Undertale. Even the Rudins themselves aren't much help. The only special characteristic I can attribute to the Rudins is that they love jewels so much that they even traded away their beds, leaving only the jewels to sleep on. That is just about the only detail I have to go off of, as Rudins themselves are very unremarkable outside of that one attribute. So, with that insignificant amount of info to go off of, what element do I think Jewel is paired with? Well, I could only think of one option that seemed somewhat reasonable. I think Jewel is paired with a new element which I am dubbing the Dragon Element. To put it simply, dragons have always existed in Toby Fox's world, with a couple minor dragons appearing in Undertale, but this species has risen to much greater prominence in Deltarune. 
the How to Draw Dragons book has been brought up multiple times, Godzilla has been shown on TV, Susie herself may be a dragon as she wields an axe made from a dragon's mane, and the Dark World has been much more fantasy oriented than even Undertale was, as Undertale was about how monsters are normal people, while the Dark World is about delving into full-blown fantasy adventures. So it would make a lot of sense for the most iconic fantasy creature to get its own element in this setting. And what are dragons famous for doing? Hoarding and sleeping on enormous piles of treasure, just like the Rudens. And that's bloody it. That is my entire argument for this prediction. To be clear, I think dragons getting their own element is quite likely. That part of my prediction has my confidence. It's the idea of dragon being paired with jewel that I am far more uncertain about. The bottom line is that I suspect dragons will get their own element, and jewels have so little evidence to work with that pairing them with dragons is my only halfway decent option. And lastly, the final element I will be discussing, and the one I have the least confidence in my prediction for, is the color element, which is held exclusively by Swatchling. What do I even do with this? Color literally exists everywhere. There's literally infinite concepts you can associate with color, which makes drawing any comparisons between this element and anything else almost entirely pointless. And the Swatchlings themselves offer next to nothing to go off of. Sure, they're butlers, but what does that have to do with anything? How does that connect to color? Even if it did matter, there are no other butlers in any Toby Fox game, so this literally gives me no clues. When fighting them, you have to lower or increase their temperature, but that's also completely useless. There's not going to be a temperature element when we've already got an ice element. The only tiny detail I have to go off of that gives me anything even vaguely approaching a clue is this description in the recruit menu, which says that they like paint by numbers. This is in reference to a coloring book where certain sections are numbered and you color them in a certain order. That's the only thing that feels like a hint. I don't think the numbers part matters, because if there was going to be a numbers element, we would have had it already. That leaves us with nothing left but the coloring book. As such, here's my completely wild guess. I think there's going to be a book element introduced, and the color element will be its pair. Boom. That's literally the only thing I can think of. It's a terrible prediction, but hey, there's this one line about Queen using a coloring book, so maybe it has some evidence. This is easily my weakest prediction, but I really can't fathom what alternative would work better. With that final element discussed, I have now given my predictions for each and every elemental pair for the elements we currently have. To be clear, I'm not saying these are the only elements that we will get. Far from it. There are a number of major elements, such as fire, that I'm certain will appear with their own pairs later down the line. But for now, these are my predictions, and while some are less confident than others, I do think all of these have a shot at being true. That brings us to the end of this video. This was the first theory I've made since the Spampton sweepstakes, so it's nice to get back into the swing of things. What do you think of my analysis of the elemental magic system? What are your thoughts on elemental pairs? I'd love to hear your own predictions in the comments down below. Now, normally, it would be at this point of the video where we'd hit the fan art section, and I'd show off all the new fan art that I've received since my last video. 
However, due to how things played out with the Spamton sweepstakes, it has been almost two months since I last reviewed y'all's fan art, which means that a huge backlog of art has piled up in that time period. If I were to review it all right now, it would tag on another half hour to this video. And while I'm happy to devote a fraction of the video's runtime to fan art, I don't think it would be reasonable for a huge percentage of it to just be fan art. People come for the theories, so the vast majority of the video should be about the theories. But that doesn't mean I don't want to praise and showcase your art. So here's my solution. Moving forward, there will no longer be fan art sections at the end of my videos. I think that's more fair for the viewers who aren't here for the fan art. But in exchange, I will now be giving your fan art its own video series moving forward, which I'm dubbing Jaru's Fan Art Showcase. Once a month, I'll upload a video showcasing all the art I've been sent in that month. It won't have to share the limelight with my theories, and it will get all the focus and attention it deserves. I hope this sounds like a valid solution to you guys moving forward. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic, as getting fan art is sincerely one of the most delightful parts of doing YouTube, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm not extremely appreciative of it. The first episode of the Jaru Fan Art Showcase will debut at the end of this month, and it will show off all the art I've yet to review thus far, which means it'll be a much longer episode than normal, so I hope you guys are looking forward to that. And, of course, I'd like to thank my patrons, whose generosity is of very real help during these difficult times. A special thanks go out to Lil Niris X, Umbra, E-Roll, and Moldbrain. And a special, special thanks go out to Captain Apac. The Mad Lad actually donated at the Spampton tier, which is insane. <laughs> I greatly appreciate it. The incredible support y'all have shown me, it, it means the world to me. Thank you so, so much. And with all that discussed, I think it's time to bring this video to a close. Like if you enjoyed the video, comment if you've got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.